Hey y'all, so in light of the upcoming lab practical and the difficulty that folks are experiencing with histology, I thought I would make a little video uh, doing a histology walkthrough for the tissue types that you need to know. Um, and I also want to say that if you're experiencing difficulty with histology and you're finding it really hard to understand what you're supposed to be looking at and seeing, that is not at all unusual. Um, histology is just plain hard and there's a steep learning curve and it takes time to get good at it. So if you're not good at it right away, that's okay. Um, I'm here to help you with that. So don't, don't add to the problem by feeling bad about it. You shouldn't. Okay, so this website that I'm going to use to do this demo is called Histology Guide and it's my favorite histology website because it's basically like having a box of slides at home. Uh, it allows you to zoom in and move around a slide of tissue the same way that you would in the lab. So um, as you can see here, and I'm going to use my favorite screen tool, Epic Pen, to show you, we have epithelium and connective tissue. And you are responsible for knowing some subsets of those tissues. Oh, and I guess we better include cartilage and bone as well. Technically, cartilage and bone are connective tissues, but here they have been um, separated out. So these are the three that we're going to be going through today. And let's dive in, shall we? Okay, so I'm going to start with epithelium. <clears throat> And let's look at figure eight first. So you are responsible for knowing not all of these, but only a couple of them. So let's point those out. You are responsible for knowing simple squamous epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium, simple cuboidal epithelium, and simple columnar epithelium. So we have completely left off the stratified cuboidal and columnar, and these weirdo ones that don't neatly fall into any category, so you don't have to worry about those at all. Um, one thing to note and to remember as you're looking is the naming system. So notice that we have these here, which are the names according to cell shape, and then here we have the name according to number of layers of cells. So in histology, anything um, that has more than one layer of cells, if it's a piece of epithelium, we call stratified, and then anything that has only one, we call simple. So the counting system in histology is really simple. It's just one or lots, that's all. Um, so over here on this little menu, if I can move my pen interface, we've got uh, just the descriptions of the different kinds of epithelium. So cuboidal cells appear about as tall as they are wide. Um, the surface view reveals that they are more hexagonal, but you only really ever see them from the side where they look square. And they have nice spherical nu nuclei which are positioned in the center of the cell. Columnar cells are taller than they are wide, and they have oval-shaped nuclei, nuclei that are located near the base of the cell. So their nuclei tend to hide down away from the apical surface and more towards the basement membrane. So now that we've done that, let's look at some individual tissue types, and I'm going to start with simple squamous epithelium. All right, so let's navigate backward and move on down. <clears throat> oh, I like this one. This has simple epithelium. So let's click on this. And so this is basically looking at simple squamous epithelium. No, I don't want to zoom in. I want to navigate. All right, so now we're looking at a piece of kidney, which is a place that you can find simple squamous epithelium. So remember, simple squamous means there's a single layer of thin, flat cells. The problem is that the kidney is made up of a bunch of different kinds of epithelium, kind of wadded up into an organ. And so there's a mixture of simple columnar, simple cuboidal, and simple squamous epithelium in this organ. So where do you find, and I'm going to switch to a color that is not similar to the color of the tissue because that's confusing. Let's do this blue color. So where you find the simple squamous epithelium on a kidney are in these little round structures here. So those are going to be these little guys. 
So these are called renal corpuscles, as you can see here. And these are little balls of cells that sit in a space, which is why they have white around them. And the lining of that space is simple squamous epithelium. So I'm going to zoom in on one of these really closely and show you where the squamous epithelium is. But if you look to this illustration right here, the pieces of this little guy are as follows. There is a structure in the middle called a glomerulus. There's a space, and that space is lined with simple squamous epithelium. So here's a squamous cell, here's a squamous cell, here's a squamous cell. So that's what you're looking for. And fortunately, as you can probably see from the picture that we have here, there's lots and lots and lots of renal corpuscles in this field of view. So the other nice thing about this website is if you go over to the sidebar and you click on the linked blue uh, links, it'll just zoom you in on the thing that they're trying to show you automatically, which is really, really nice. And they've picked out some really good examples of the tissues that you need to know. Um, so here we have a renal corpuscle, and you can see it looks very similar to the drawing on the right. So that begs the question, where is our simple squamous epithelium? Well, you can see this is a simple squamous cell. Here's another one. That one looks like it's dividing. Here's another. Here's another. So all of these cells around the edge are simple squamous epithelium. So that's how you find that on a kidney slide. So if we click, let's try clicking simple squamous and see if anything changes in our field of view here. Yeah, it just zoomed in a little bit. That's not surprising. Sorry, I'm trying to erase and my pen isn't cooperating. There we go. Okay, so that is simple squamous. Let's look at some other kinds of tissues that we can see in the field of view on a kidney. So there are more than just the one. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Now you can see that there's other kinds of tubes here because you can see numerous lumens. And remember, a lumen is the empty white space um, that the epithelium, whatever it is, is lining. So I see some nice simple cuboidal over here. So I'm going to zoom in on that. There we go. OK, so let's give that a second to crisp up, and then I will show you some features of it. So when you're looking for simple cuboidal epithelium, you're generally looking for a cross section of a tube or a duct, and that is indeed what we see here. So this is a kidney tubule, and here I will outline it. I want a bigger dot. There we go. OK. So I'm going to outline the entire section of the tube that we're looking at. So this is a not quite uh, sagittal section of a tube. So it's, it's somewhere between a cross section and a longitudinal section. So we're going to call this an oblique section, meaning it's a section of an oval. And if you look at the cells here, you can see here is the lumen which is the white space. Um, in this case, the lumen has some stuff in it. Don't worry about that. And then we can see a single row of square cells. And they have a really spherical nucleus. So look how round all those are. And they're right in the middle of the cell. So they're not pushed away from the apical surface or the lumen. And they're not pushed down towards the basement membrane. They are right smack in the middle of these cells. So that's a really nice example of simple cuboidal epithelium that you can see right here on the same slide, the kidney slide. Um, it's got lots of simple cuboidal. This is just a really good example of that. OK, so let's zoom out. And let's zoom out a little bit more, see if there's anything else we can see here. Uh, occasionally, in some sections of the kidney, you can see um, simple columnar, but I don't think there's any on this particular slide. No, it doesn't look like there is. 
what have we here? I'm going to go over to, well, let's go to this section. So this is a mammal trachea, and this is a place that you can find simple columnar epithelium. And it's important when you're looking at these tissues to look at the edge of the tissue where you think you'd be likely to see epithelium. So if I can move this up a little. One of the tasks that you have as students is to learn how to microscope correctly. So here I'm starting at about 4x, which is where you should start. That's our scanning lens, remember, and we always want to start on the scanning lens so we can get enough context for what we're seeing. Because as you can see here, not everything on this slide is the same. Um, and so I know by looking at it, because I've done this a lot of times, what everything is, even at this low magnification, you don't necessarily know that yet, but you'll learn to do it. Regardless, it's important to start on the scanning lens always. So I am looking for epithelium, and I know that epithelium lines lumens, and lumens are typically round-shaped spaces. And so I see from this chunk of tissue that there is a concave edge and a convex edge. So here is the convex edge and here is the concave edge. Now if I know that I'm looking for the inside lining of a tube, it makes sense that I would not pick this edge out here because it's not the right shape. It doesn't look like the inside of a tube, it looks like the outside of a tube. So I'm gonna sort of start zooming in on this edge instead because logically that seems like a better place to find epithelium. So let's begin zooming in. Whoops, I forgot to put my cursor back to regular. So let's start zooming in on this. Hmm, yeah, that looks promising. So another cue that you can use to sort of, I don't want to pan down that much. There we go. Another cue that you can sort of use to check to see if you're looking at epithelium or a good candidate for epithelium is organization. So this edge of the tissue has a high degree of organization. I can see a very distinct rim and then uh, another layer and then a layer of clumpy things and then some other layers. Over here, I kind of just have shreddy chaos. So there's big empty spaces, there's stuff hanging off the edge, the edge is uneven. This is not a good candidate for being epithelium. Epithelium is far more organized than this. So let's continue to zoom in here and see what we can see. All right, so I'm actually not liking this very much as far as an example, um, but it did provide us with a good lesson about how to locate the edge of the tissue that you think epithelium uh, lives in. And I accidentally closed my browser. All right, I'm back. Sorry, I accidentally closed my browser and I didn't want you guys to have to watch me reopen it. That sounds boring. So now we're gonna move on to simple columnar epitheliums. So remember, we're expecting to see a single layer of tall skinny cells. <clears throat> now this is a little bit harder uh, with the intestine because there's a lot going on here as you can see, but with the intestine slides you always want to navigate to this side of the slide. Um, the side that seems and looks messier, but really this is where the epithelium is. So these little folds here are called villi and the folds are basically increasing the surface area of the intestine so that you have maximum absorptive capability. So all of these little tiny villi here are little folds of simple columnar epithelium. So I'm gonna zoom in on some of these folds and we're gonna see what there is to see. So let's go back to cursor and I like this area. So I'm gonna try and zoom in on that. over here. All right, so let's wait for the image to clear up. That looks good. So going over here, we have zoomed in on our villi, which are our little finger-like folds of epithelium. And here we can see this layer of cells 
is very distinct from what's inside of here, right there. You can kind of see that there's a natural delineation or demarcation line. So if we zoom in one little tiny bit closer, there we go. What you can see is a single layer of cells. So the layer is between this green line that I'm drawing and here. So that makes this the lumen. And then you can see a bunch of cells side by side. Notice they're tall, so their width is less than their height. And additionally, if you look at the position of their nucleus, their nucleus is down here, and their nuclei are not all round. Some of them are kind of smooshed into an oval, like this is a good one, and so is this one. So those are your two clues that this is simple columnar epithelium because you have tall skinny cells with a nucleus that is squished down away from the apical surface. Um, and it's important to distinguish between the apical surface and the lumen. So the lumen is the name for this white space. It's the name for an absence of tissue, whereas the apical surface is the name for the top of the epithelium. So. There we go. Um, and we, I'm using the term top loosely because that implies upness, right? But within an epithelium, you can have many different orientations. So for example, this right here is also simple columnar epithelium on the opposite side of our lumen here. So I can do the same drawing really. And we have, there's our epithelium, and if I draw imaginary lines between cells, I can see that there are tall, skinny cells that have oval nuclei that are down away from the apical surface. So that's our simple columnar epithelium. Um, also, these white spaces you may or may not see, depending on what kind of tissue you're looking at, those are mucus that is going to be excreted into the lumen um, by specialized simple columnar cells called goblet cells. So if you see those, it's a good hint that you're looking at simple columnar epithelium because simple columnar epithelium tends to have a lot of goblet cells. All right, so now we've seen simple cuboidal, simple columnar, and simple squamous epithelium. So now I'm gonna go back, oopsie. I'm gonna go back and we're gonna look at the stratified squamous epithelium. So let's see here. I guess I have to slide down. Aha, stratified squamous. Okay, so let's see. I have a lot of choices here. Um, let's do esophagus. That's a good one. So remember, we're looking for lumens and looking for candidate edges, which are likely to have our tissue of interest. So if I'm doing those things, Here's a very obvious lumen, which means this is probably the tissue that I'm looking for. Not this, not this. So this is another example of why it's really important to start with the scanning lens, because if you don't start with the scanning lens, and let's say you zoomed all the way in using the 40x objective, and you zoomed in right there, you'd have a hell of a time trying to find the epithelium. So you'd just be searching in here where there is no epithelium. So that's why it's important to use the scanning lens and why I talk about it so much. Students really want to zoom all the way in right away. Um, it's an impulse that uh, I think is just based on logic. You think you're going to see the most clearly if you're the closest. And I understand why people think that. Um, it's not true though. Okay, so now I've established where my lumen is and my edge that I'm interested in. So now I'm going to zoom in on my edge that I want to see. So let's go closer, shall we? Come on. Okay, so I'm going to show you some things at this magnification and then we're going to zoom in even further. So here we have the basement membrane. Oopsie. Let's zoom out just a little bit. I'm trying to zoom out, but it's interpreting my motions as panning left. There we go. Good machine. Okay, so 
this is our stratified squamous epithelium. Now you're going to notice that the cells down here, and why am I saying down when it's clearly up? By down, I mean away from the apical surface. So if this is the apical surface, that means from the perspective of the tissue, this is down. So away from the apical surface. So these cells away from the apical surface are definitely not squamous, they're round. But remember, we only diagnose tissue type by the shape of the cells at the apical surface. So it doesn't matter what the cells down here are shaped like. If these ones are thin and flat, then we're calling it squamous all the way down. So let's zoom in on some of those cells, if the uh, picky computer will permit it. So I'm going to pan around to find some good cells. Yeah, those are pretty decent. Okay, so let's zoom in right there. So these cells at the top you can see are thin and flat as promised. So they are fitting their squamous name. And as you can see, there are many, many layers of them making them stratified. So it doesn't really matter again what the cells at the base of the membrane look like as long as the cells at the top are thin and flat and you can clearly see that they are by me outlining them um, that qualifies this tissue as stratified squamous okay so let's go back now and we're gonna look at some connective tissue so i have to go back further so let's select our chapter three and there's a bunch of tissues on here that are not ones you have to know. So you need to navigate down to the tissues that you do have to know, the ones from your lab modules. So here is one. This is the dense regular connective tissue. So unlike epithelium, which lines a lumen and you have to look for a good edge, not so with connective tissue. It doesn't have that kind of organization. So we can just zoom in any old place, which is what I'm going to do now. And let's pan up a little bit. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and click on fibroblasts and see what happens. Yep, that looks pretty good. Okay, so what you have when you're looking at dense irregular connective tissue is an extracellular matrix. Extracellular matrix means outside of cell. Extracellular matrix that is mostly not cells. So unlike epithelium, when you're looking at the tissue and there's a lot of cells packed closely together, it's not really true for dense irregular connective tissue or connective tissue in general, uh, a lot of times you have cells that are spaced far apart from each other and there's other stuff in between them. So in this case, the extra, extracellular matrix equals a lot of collagen fibers. And it's called dense regular connective tissue because these collagen fibers run in parallel to each other. All right, I'm back, sorry. I had to pause for a second because my dog had something in his mouth that he wasn't supposed to have in his mouth, namely a sock. Dog parenthood, it's magical. Okay, so when I left off, I was mentioning the collagen fibers that are running in parallel. So these big pink swaths of tissue are all collagen fibers. Um, and as you can see, they are running parallel to each other. So not crisscrossed every which way, but in nice orderly lines. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because there's another kind of connective tissue called dense irregular, um, which has all the same stuff. It's just that the connective tissue collagen fibers go in every which direction, so it looks less organized. Alrighty, so here we have fibroblasts, which are the cell type of the dense connective tissues. And fibroblasts do what they sound like they do. So a fibroblast is a cell that makes fibers, specifically collagen fibers. So these cells that I've circled here have made and secreted the cell, the excuse me, the collagen fibers around them. So this uh, goes back to the extracellular matrix talks that we were having in uh, our discussions of cell biology in lecture. And remember, uh, the first picture I showed you guys of extracellular matrix stuff included proteoglycans and also collagen fibers. So these are elements that are excreted by the cell um, for some particular purpose. In the case of dense regular connective tissue, um, this makes up tendons and ligaments. 
So these provide great tensile strength, um, tensile strength being resistance to being pulled apart in one direction. So this tissue is really strong in this direction. So if I took the arrows and pulled them, the tissue is going to resist pulling in the direction of the arrows. It's less strong in this direction. So tendons stick muscles to bones and ligaments stick bones to other bones. And you wanna have a nice tough fibrous connection between the two. So that's really the point of this tissue and its function is to resist tensile force in one direction. And the collagen fibers allow it to achieve that. Okay, so let's go back, oopsie, and look at some other connective tissue. So one kind is dense irregular connective tissue, and that's this messy stuff under here. So you don't have that on your list, but it does exist, so just be aware of it as you're making your way through this stuff. The other kinds of connective tissues that you have on your list are gonna be back here under cartilage and bone. So hyaline cartilage, is the kind of cartilage that you are responsible for. And there is a lot of that um, in the trachea, so the windpipe, and also at the ends of long bones. So that's two places we can look for it. I'm gonna select trachea. And so this is the longitudinal section of the trachea. And this is the cross section. So I'm gonna zoom in on this area right here. Okay, so what we're looking for here is an abundance of cells in a gel matrix. So gel is, in this case, made from proteoglycans attracting water. And that gel is really, really stiff, um, which is what cartilage is good for. It provides structural support. So what you're gonna see is chondrocytes surrounded by matrix, and the matrix is that uh, proteoglycan ground substance. So here's that word, proteoglycan. There is some type two collagen in there, but you can't really see it. All you can really see is purple. So I'm gonna trash all my drawings and let's zoom into chondrocytes. Wait for the screen to catch up here. Okay, so here we are up close and personal with hyaline cartilage. So hyaline is a word that means glassy or glass-like. And as you can see, this tissue is kind of resembling stained glass, which is really pretty. So this stuff right here, and I'm gonna choose a slightly smaller dot size. So this area, this nice sort of trans semi-transparent purple space between cells. This is the matrix and it's made of proteoglycans and collagen. And then the cells of uh, cartilage are called chondrocytes. So the root word C-H-O-N-D means cartilage and an oocyte is just a suffix that means cell. So these cells live in little spaces in the matrix because the matrix is a semi-solid. So the cells don't really move around within the matrix. They are just sort of fixed in one position. So the chondrocytes in this tissue are what I'm circling here, and they live in a little space called a lacuna, and that's just the hole or absence of matrix that the cell occupies. So you can think of it like being uh, the cell's apartment. So that is hyaline cartilage. It doesn't always stain this purple, although it often does. Um, and that's because of the protein residues that proteoglycans have. They tend to pick up the dark bluish purple stain rather than the pink stain. All right, so let's go back to connective tissue and we're gonna check out some bone. So the kind of bone that you have is compact bone, and I know that yours is stained with uh, hematoxylin and eosin, so yours are reddish pink, um, but we don't have those stains on here, so there's two ways you can stain bone without those. One is India ink, like the kind you would buy in the art store. You just uh, take the slice and bathe it in India ink, and you get uh, India ink in spaces in that delineate structures, or you can use a brown stain called Schmorl's stain. And this is, Schmorl is the last name of a person, but this is one of my favorite stain names because I think it's funny. 
So let's select Schmoral Sustain. That's what I want to look at. Okay, so Compact Bone looks a lot like tree rings. So this, as you can see, kind of resembles like some gnarled wood almost. Uh, and that's because of the functional units of bone. So within a functional unit of bone, which is called an osteon, let's go check one out. So we have a couple here, actually. So an osteon is one of these circular units right here. So I circled one. Here I'm going to circle another one. And this is another osteon, um, as well as this right here. So you can see at the center of each osteon is a haversion canal. And around the haversion canal are multiple layers. Oopsie. Sorry, I turned my tablet and my computer thought I was doing a thing. I'm not. I should have put screen lock on. So these are my haversion canals. And then if you, I'm going to zoom in one additional unit here. Do, do, do. I want to zoom in just a little bit. There we go. Okay, so let's trash these. And I'm looking at the layers around the haversion canal. So you can see that there's a ring here, a ring here, a ring here, a small ring here, and a ring here. So those are just like the growth rings on trees. Those rings are called lamellae, which is just a name for the tube-like layer of bone that surrounds the central canal. And then we also have little holes between lamellae. You can see these as dark specks that I'm putting arrows on. And these are the lacunae, which is a space in the bony matrix where a bone cell lives. You can also see radiating from the lacunae canaliculi. So canaliculi, can, canaliculus singular means tiny canal. So canaliculi means tiny canals. So canaliculi are the tiny canals that connect adjacent lacunae. So if we zoom even further in and select this, I will draw you some arrows to them. So as you can see, here we have a lacuna, right? And here's another one. Notice how radiating out from them are these tiny little dark lines. Those are canaliculi. So these allow cells that live in these lacunae to communicate with their neighbors. So this is a cell in here, and it can communicate with this cell up here via exchanging fluids and ions and such through these tiny little canals. So all of these little dark lines here that are very, very ubiquitous throughout the slide. These are canaliculi. Okay, so let's see if we can find, I don't see any. Um, so there are haversian canals, which are these central ones that are in the middle of each uh, osteon. There's another kind as well that you might see, and I'll see if the other section of bone has any. Let's look at the India ink one. So the nice thing about the India ink stain is that you can see extremely distinct uh, osteons. So some of them get stained darker than others. So you can see all kinds of osteons here. Uh, nope, I don't see one. So I was looking for a Folkman's canal. Those are canals that connect to adjacent haversion canals. So there's uh, horizontal tubes as well as vertical ones in this bone. Uh, I cannot see any distinct ones. There is a beginning of one. Oh, wait, there's one right there. Let's zoom in on that. So I'm going to zoom in on this area. So here you can see for this one, it's, there we go. Let's pan a little bit. Yeah, perfect. So for this one, it's central canal has this offshoot going off to the left. And we can't see where it goes because of the angle at which this bone section has been ground down. But a Folkman's canal is a canal which connects to Haversian canals. So this is a Folkman's canal. So in a Haversian canal, in bone that's alive, so not this bone, there is typically th three things at least. One of those things is an artery which are thick and red. 
The other is a vein, which I'm going to illustrate as being skinny and blue. Veins aren't really blue. We color them blue to denote that they don't have oxygenated blood in them. And then a lymphatic vessel, which carries lymph. Oh, and I almost missed the important part, a nerve. So each of these contains veins and arteries. lymphatic vessels and nerves. So this is why it hurts when you break a bone because you have nerves inside of your bones. Sorry, that's just the way it is. So the reason we have these is because the cells that live in the lacunae are alive and so they're going to need to dispose of wastes and also collect uh, gases and nutrients just like any other cell would. So we need a way to get those things to and from those cells. So there's a network of increasingly tiny canals that connect osteons to each other. So these tubes are going to run through this space as well to go to the adjacent osteon. And then the osteon center, the central canal, is also open to the network of canaliculi so that uh, nutrients and oxygen and wastes can trickle back and forth between this canal and these tiny canals such that the cells get their needs met. So that's what I wanted to show you there. And I think that is all for our exploration of connective tissues. So um, I'm going to post this right away and then get to work on the lecture video, but hopefully this will help you prepare for your lab practical a little better um, from home. So happy weekend, everybody.